Good evening. Welcome again to Extension 720. Our guest tonight was with us about six months ago, G. Gordon Liddy. At that time, we had a fascinating conversation, but to me, in a way, a very frustrating one, because I wanted to get into some of the detail of the Watergate operation, his role in the Committee for the Re-Election of the President, and for that matter, his earlier role in the White House Plumbers Group. And though we talked about it in generalities, and significant generalities, we could not get down to the case, because Mr. Liddy was then under wraps. The statute of limitations had not yet fully run out. He has now told all, or a version of all, his version, and a truthful one as he sees it, of all, and he's done that in a book significantly titled simply Will, W-I-L-L. He views his own life as a test of will and as the conquest of will over adversity and over pain itself. So we'll be talking tonight with Gordon Liddy about himself, about his recent years as a significant actor in the great public drama, and about his years in prison, uh, because that accounts for quite a recent batch of time. He's only been out for a year or two. On to a conversation with G. Gordon Liddy right after the usual update on the evening's news from George Bauer. Here's Milt Rosenberg on tonight's Extension 720. G. Gordon Liddy has done a book of multiple value. It illuminates a great deal about Watergate and related matters. It also is a portrait of a life, a life viewed, I think, with compelling honesty by the man who has lived it, though whether he comes to the ultimate truth about himself remains to be seen. Um, I may want to suggest a bit later on tonight that there are meanings in your own life, Gordon, that you have not yet quite caught, though all the data are laid out in this excellent autobiography. There's yet another quality to this book that I want to mention instantly. It is superbly written, and you are, in fact, uh, quite a good writer, and that... uh, means that those people you went to when you were a young man casting about for something to do who gave you aptitude tests and told you that you would best be fitted for a job as an editor may not have been completely wrong. I I knew I was going to get caught on that, and and it does not surprise me in the least, Dr. Rosenberg, that you are the gentleman who caught me on it. And before we even address that, I just want to uh, thank you for having me back on your program. I I was on it once before, and it it remains an outstanding experience in in my mind, and I'm I'm really delighted to be back here having this conversation with you. Yes, sir, I I read a book. It was a softcover book, as I recall about the Human Engineering Laboratory established by uh, the Johnson O'Connor Research Foundation. This was uh, in my youth when I was uh, really uh, undecided as to what to do, really didn't know what I wanted to do. And I invested the the then, or rather I think it was my mother, invested the then uh, significant sum of $300 in three days of testing at the laboratory. And that was what they told me. And uh, it was not what I wanted to hear, and I promptly disregarded it. And uh, you're quite correct, sir. It, it appears, after all these years, that they were right and I was wrong. Don't you sometimes wish these days that you had followed their advice and gone into a journalistic or publishing career? Well, the, perhaps so, except that. Uh, it's all very uh, well and good to be a writer, but one has to have something to write about. You've got something to write about now, all right. uh, Yeah, I guess I do, yeah. Um, I'm going to slight the first half of your book for the moment, though I think uh, the um, the account of your first 30 years or so, or so is utterly uh, compelling, and we may return to it later. But I'm eager to get to the day, June, or to the month at least, June 1971, when you went to work in the White House. Yes, sir. But we need at least to set the background, and so here's my summary of your vita up to that moment. Mm -hmm. Born in 1930 in New Jersey, just overlooking the Hudson toward New York, a childhood hounded by fears and irrational terrors, which you began even as a child to combat and uh, began to conceive that it was necessary for you to steel yourself against your own fear, and that has been one compelling theme throughout your life, it would seem. Parochial school, on to Fordham for a bachelor's degree, two years in the Army, back to Fordham for a law degree, and shortly after that, into service with the FBI, where you served for five years, some of them spent just in our backyard in Gary, Indiana. And then um, into the law firm that your father headed, and uh, from there on to a job as a prosecutor in Poughkeepsie, New York, 
a run for Congress as the conservative candidate and also contesting Hamilton Fish Jr. in the Republican primary, which you lost, also running the central New York campaign for Mr. Nixon's 1968 run, and on the basis of such services you rendered there, on to Washington for a job in the Treasury Department, mm -hmm. where in fact you were already involved in some secret operations, essentially concerning gun control and um, drug control, drug yes. traffic control, and from there into the White House, and almost instantly assigned to be a member of the plumber's team. Yes, well, the, the only uh, thing I would just want to uh, correct on that, uh, Dr. Rosenberg, is while I uh, was raised in New Jersey, I actually was born in New York City and then moved over very early in my life. But, but uh, your, your uh, summary is, is essentially quite All accurate. Right. I got one bargain that I want to strike with you right now. All right. Uh, I'll have to start calling you Mr. Liddy rather than Gordon unless you call me Milt. That's established now into the White House, oh, June 1971. All right. I just want, I just want our listeners to know that I, that I hesitate to call uh, a, a professor and a doctor Milt. I do so because you ask me, and I now consider you to be my friend. Uh, but when I was raised, uh, one respected such men as, as you and, and gave that respect by using the title. But... We'll, we'll use the, uh, the familiar, if, you, if it makes you more comfortable. Now, here's my invitation. Uh, we've had already newspaper accounts of uh, this book and of uh, the few dramatic interviews you did in New York where you confronted Jack Anderson, uh, of whom you reveal in this book, you or for whom you had once worked out an assassination intention, Yes. though that was not uh, authorized by anybody higher up, and so it did not get executed, and he did not get executed. Yeah. You had similar notions about Howard Hunt. We may come to that later, but you thought that you might be called upon to kill him when both of you were in prison and you right. were preparing a plan to do that. Correct. And so you confronted both of those guys in two different network shows. We've had newspaper accounts of that. We've had the Time magazine excerpts of your book. Uh, excerpting a book, even when the great editors at Time do it, doesn't possibly give you the full content of the book. Uh, so I want to ask you to give us a, v a version of at least the second half of the book in this form. Mm -hmm. Let's go into the White House in June 1971 mm -hmm. and talk about the main experiences that you had and how you perceived what was happening around you and what values guided you as you began to formulate the Odessa plan as uh, one of the me uh, key members of the plumber's team, and then Operation Gemstone, a part of which turned out to be Watergate, when you went on to be counsel, that being essentially a cover identity, really head of intelligence True. for the committee to re-elect the president. True. Your version, and we can take our time with this, oh, I'll right. be jumping in occasionally to pose a question. Yes, please, or, please do. Or prompt. Uh, because uh, I'm, so, I'm so close to it that, that uh, perhaps I might skip over something simply because I'm so close and familiar with it that you might think our listeners would, would find a more interest. Uh, in June of 1971, uh, when I moved over to the White House, I, I moved over uh, principally because of the, the efforts of John Mitchell to, to get me over there through Bud Krog. And I think to answer your question well, I, I must give our listeners a picture of how I perceived the situation at that time. Now, you know, when we we look back sometimes through the rose-colored glasses of nostalgia, and we're likely perhaps to view the 60s as a time of uh, gentle little girls uh, padding about in bare feet and granny dresses, carrying daisies and what have you. And certainly there was some of that. But unfortunately for us all, uh, there was... Uh, Mark Rudd, who was then preaching that uh, we ought to uh, kill police simply because they were police, that we ought to blow up police stations, blow up banks, and uh, destroy, I think he, uh, he said, to use his words, this country we all hate, and I'm quoting. Uh, he was not the only person who felt that way. There was the bombings of the Mathematics Center up here in Wisconsin, in which the father of two was slain. Indeed, the bombing of our own national capital in Washington. I think 125 cities in the previous year had uh, uh, gone up in flames, so to speak, in riots. Uh, Forty killed, I believe, in Detroit. Twenty-one in Watts. It was a, really a, a terrible situation. And as I viewed it at the time, we were not only engaged in, a, in an external war in Southeast Asia, but we were engaged, really, in a civil war here at home. Uh, and so it was in that context and with that perception 
that I moved to the White House from the Treasury. Looking for or welcoming the opportunity to do what about the problem? To, to, uh, uh, define. to, com to engage, uh, indeed, in that civil war. On behalf to join of the right side in the I, civil yes, war. Yes, that's correct, as I, as I perceived it. And yes, that sir. right side would be the side that found a way to control, suppress, and in essence disarm the, uh, the rebels. Yes, uh, and always distinguishing between uh, mere protestors and, and the people who were throwing the bombs and, and, and lighting the gasoline and things of that sort. Now, uh, when I arrived... Uh, I had no office space, and uh, Bud Krogh took me aside and said, all right, uh, at first uh, you're going to be sort of continuing what you're doing with uh, gun control and, and the business with drugs and narcotics. But he said, you know, we've got a, a really, really serious situation here that I'm going to have you uh, principally involved in. And he said, I want you to meet somebody first before we go any further. And he took me into another room, and he introduced me to a man called David Young. And... And after a, a very brief introduction, uh, David Young was behind a desk. He was busy with his papers, and uh, we left. Uh, Bud said that he had recently attended a meeting uh, at which were present the President of the United States and Dr. Kissinger, who was then his national security advisor, and John Ehrlichman and himself and, and perhaps another or so, at which meeting both the President and Dr. Kissinger expressed in the most forceful way possible, outrage and great distress at the fact that leaks of information were, in effect, rendering it virtually impossible for the United States to conduct foreign diplomacy. Um, for example, if you and I are playing poker, I'm just, no way I'm going to be successful if there's somebody standing behind me reading my cards off to you. And this was what was happening. And what had, what had happened to trigger uh, and, and perhaps form the catalyst of the rage in, in the Oval Office was the release of the McNamara study known popularly as the Pentagon Papers by Dr. Ellsberg. First contentious interruption. Yes, sir. Uh, you say that what really motivated you was your desire to do something about the violence that was uh, overwhelming America. Violence uh, initiated essentially by radical leftist young people with revolutionary intention. Yet, see how quickly you shift, and this is visible in the book. Once you get into the White House, you're not going after the bomb throwers. You're going after... Uh, a former DOD official who's been uh, shifted to the left and has altered his values, Daniel Ellsberg, and what gets you and what gets the White House and everybody so angry about him is that he released the Pentagon Papers. But the Pentagon Papers didn't tell the Soviets anything that they didn't already know, not much of any great value in terms of continuing strategic conflict between well, let's, us let's and them. Well, let's address that. I mean, it, it, as you say, it is a contentious uh, question, but it is a good question. Uh, Dr. Ellsberg... Uh, uh, took the entire McNamara study plus another uh, body of uh, classified information, highly classified information, the actual extent of which at that point we did not know. And we had been given uh, the information that a complete set of the McNamara study had been delivered to the Soviet embassy on 16th Street in Washington. Now, uh, I would uh, point out to you that the New York Times, to its credit, I might add, did not publish all the McNamara study that it received uh, via Dr. Ellsberg. There were some things that it withheld because, indeed, there were some things which uh, would be damaging if given to the Soviet Union. And let, let's just give a quick example that if, if, if you and I have been engaging in, engaged in a coded conversation for some years that has not has been unreadable, although recordable by electronic means, and now suddenly uh, the other side receives the key, they can read all that, and they can pick up an awful lot of information pretty rapidly. Uh, but I also want to point out that, with, that, that we were indeed addressing ourselves to the, the bomb-throwing group, so to speak, because one of our principal concerns was this, sir. We did not know what we had there in Dr. Ellsberg. Was he a, a romantic loner of the left, operating essentially uh, by himself? Or was he part of a resu or some sort of uh, 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 group with the KGB? We didn't know. 
Now, again, to answer your question intelligently, I've got to give you a little bit of background. And it, and it uh, is necessary to throw some insights into the, the White House and the way it, it was. In the Nixon White House, and I suspect in any administration, as one nears the top, the peak of power, the president, those uh, immediately around him at the apex of that pyramid are constantly elbowing each other, trying to get closer, trying to, to uh, be the one closest to the ear of the president, they to even the do that, source they, of power. They even do that at Fordham University. No, I wouldn't be a bit not surprised. To, not to mention the university that I work at. All right. In all bureaucratically structured all organizations, right. well, then, where there is some chain of then command, we there are those that. who want to get close to the right. top of the command. So when, so when the, the uh, organization which became Odessa was first founded, it did not surprise me to see that we had indeed a representative of each of those principally, uh, principal contending elements. Uh, I was there as, as, as the Mitchell man and, and Ehrlichman man, so to speak. Although Young I, was there as the Kissinger as the man. the Kissinger man. He had just left Dr. Kissinger's staff. And then uh, Howard Hunt, Hunt showed up. Hunt shows up, and, then, and we have now heard from Chuck Colson. You, you see the pattern. All right. Uh, we, started to, uh, we started to work, and much has been made of uh, the, the, the Colson desire through, through Hunt to get information uh, to reduce or alter perceptibly the image of Dr. Ellsberg, who was then sort of the lion of the left. But more to the point as far as I was concerned, for my concerns and for those of my principles, was who is this man? Now, we knew uh, from wiretap information, or information I believe the source of which was a wiretap, that although his uh, treatment by Dr. Fielding had terminated, his relationship was so close to the man that any time something significant happened in his life, or indeed sometimes when something trivial happened in his life, at any hour of the day or the night, he would pick up the telephone and call Dr. Fielding and tell him about it. And we thought that Dr. Fielding, uh, being a professional man, might well have put that into the files. And certainly, if that was the pattern, Something so serious an event in the life of Dr. Ellsberg as what he had done with the McNamara study might have been related to Dr. Fielding. And we might find out, was he a member of a, of a spy ring or was he the romantic line? And so that leads us to the point where the uh, black bag mission to Dr. Fielding's office in California is yes, conceived. Sir. You and Hunt, together with some of those same Cubans who shortly thereafter distinguished themselves at Watergate, Correct. went off to California to break in and yes, search first, out the, the documents in Fielding's file. The first mission was, was a reconnaissance, uh, and that was done by uh, Mr. Hunt and by me alone. And thereafter, after we had drawn up a plan to go in and, and uh, see whether or not there was such a file and what uh, it contained, uh, that plan was then approved, and we went. And that was on the... Uh, uh, Labor Day weekend, I believe, of uh, 1971. And it yielded nothing except the sense of success at having uh, done the mission without having been caught. Well, or... as, as often uh, as, as oft times occurs, unfortunately, in that kind of work, uh, the men went in, and uh, what we had hoped to find there simply was not there. That was the reason that thereafter we proposed that uh, we go into Dr. Fielding's apartment because we thought, well, maybe because it's a closed file and there is limited file space in the office, maybe he's got it at the apartment. How However, long, that mission was not approved. How long were you at the White House uh, in the plumber's operation uh, designing and running your section of the plumber's operation, which you codenamed Odessa? How long were you there before you went over to the committee to re-elect the president? Uh, okay, first of all, let, uh, let me just alter your, your, your question there a little bit. Odessa was the name of the entire unit that subsequently became dubbed after it was no longer in existence, the plumbers. Odessa was the name, and Odessa was the sensitivity indicator used on the documents. Uh, I was there f uh, from June through December of that year. All of that uh, Odessa time uh, was really essentially about six months. And by the beginning of 72, you had uh, gone over to committee to re-elect Yes, I, I think it was um, about uh, 7 or 8 December of 71 when I went over to the committee. There is a theme throughout this book. I pause for a psychological inquiry, which right. I want to address 
to you, then we've got to pause for some commercials. Surely. Then we'll get your answer. And it maybe leads us over to uh, okay. the operations uh, at committee to re-elect the president. You notice I haven't yet said creep, or if I have, I didn't mean to. But yet, it's a useful acronym, and I may have to use it. Um, but the theme is this. You label that Odessa. You're able to work out an acronym based upon some of the subparts of the plan and the code letters or words that designated them. But you're also quite aware that Odessa was... Uh, and for all I know still is the name of a of a German under Emeling and SS and Geherigen right. specifically I, I, I knew a few fellows who belonged you knew a few fellows who belonged to it that's the organization of uh, German World War II veterans and they are seen as right wing and, and perhaps Nazi in inclination um, throughout this book you make very clear that you're interested in the Teutonic and you have a special sort of reaction to it I tick off just a few such things um, you like the German language you find that when you're thinking formally and organizationally you tend to go to German words or German uh, acronyms. You um, remember one of your earliest childhood memories is of the excitement you felt and the thrill you felt when your German nurse at home turned on the radio to listen to a speech uh, that Hitler was giving and the exciting thunderous shouts of Sieg Heil overwhelmed you with a sense of the high drama of the occasion. When you ran for Congress and uh, and uh, you had some people cheering for you. What flashes to, uh, through your memory is the analogy between that and uh, that speech of Hitler's that you heard when you were a little boy. You indicate that you like to give a... Um, uh, that when you learned uh, to say uh, the Pledge of Allegiance in your school, they had you point with an outstretched arm to the flag. It looks rather like the fascist or Nazi salute, and you somehow still tend to want to do that whenever you are in the proximity of the flag or something of the sort. You make clear that... Um, you take race, or at least genetics, very seriously, and that when you decided you wanted to be married, it was important to you to find, uh, for a wife, a woman who was Teutonic in background and had the right genes. Uh, she should have height and uh, possibly a good uh, competence in mathematics. Why that, I don't know. But she should be Teutonic. Uh, all of this suggests a kind of um, obsessed preoccupation with things German and maybe with... Germanism uh, or Teutonism, manque or regressed in the latter day form which we came to know as Nazism. Uh, when you're selling an aspect of gemstone to the Attorney General of the United States, you make clear that a special operations group, as you coded it, is really Einsatzkommando General, you say to him, instead Einsatz of calling Gruppe. him General. Einsatzgruppe Kommando or whatever. The whole point is that there's this kind of preoccupation with that imagery. And uh, late in the book, when um, a jail keeper, a guard at one of the places uh, that you're at, tries to defend you from some prisoners who are coming at you, you say, no, I'm going to handle them alone. They may kill me, but I'll kill a number of them uh, if they do. And this guy, who's a Hungarian refugee, says... Mr. Liddy, you are really a fascist. Now, I don't think you are a fascist, but I think somehow you're drawn to that model of will, the very name of your book, and blood, and the testing of endurance, and finally, uh, a very dark view of human nature, which reduces to the combat of implacably opposed forces. Uh, by golly, I've said a, I've made you a little speech, and I'm suggesting that there's a layer of meaning which, though... One finds it in your book, one doesn't find it finally analyzed by you. And I wonder how all of that relates to your performance in Creep when you went over across the park and went uh, to those offices and began to conceive that which became Operation Gemstone, whose great masterpiece of confusion was the Watergate break-in and what ensued. Uh, are you aware of any question I've asked you, Gordon? I've made a whole characterization, and I, I guess I... I, I no, I, I, I think you have... You have uh certainly given me some uh, food for thought, and certainly our viewers food for thought. Why don't you let me uh, munch on this a bit while, while you go for your commercials, and then I'll address what you've just said when we return. That was exactly my plan, and I promise, having gone into this purple passage, I will now subside and get your full <laughs> response, which I'm most interested in. Okay. Right back to Gordon Liddy after these words. Again, Milt Rosenberg on Extension 720. Thank you very much, George Bauer. To put all that yet another way, Gordon, Remember when you were here last, we talked some about Machiavelli, and clearly he's an author who's meant a great deal to you, but I would suggest to you that maybe Nietzsche is even 
more directly, a source of your Weltanschauung or Übersicht. The last time I talked about your Weltanschauung, you yeah, said you'd rather yeah, represent yeah, it as Übersicht, yeah. as overview. <laughs> um, that m so. maybe Nietzsche is the source with his conception of the Superman and his conception of life as a test of will and life finally as the individual against the forces of evil uh, which must be fully experienced and suffered if only ultimately to be, to be mastered. And all of this brings me back to the notion, not that you're a Nazi or a fascist, but that there are some values there which are of a different modality than the ones which inform um, our uh, way of life. My turn? Now it's your turn. <laughs> okay. Um, well, it's a wonderful question. It, it's, uh, it's rich and it's varied, and, and uh, I hope you'll bear with me as I, uh, I try to address it if not seriatim, at least the best I can that way. Uh, first of all, I point out in the book that one of the, one of the problems one has in uh, doing what I did in an autobiography and, and uh, attempting to uh, give you the flavor of certain ideas through the narration of events that take place over a long period of years is that it does have something of a telescoping effect. And by that I mean, uh, if you look through the long lens, uh, there is a distortion in that uh, objects which are at a distance from each other as well as from you tend to appear to be almost back-to-back. -back. Do you follow the analogy I'm using there? Well, that I think might help contribute to uh, the conclusions which I won't say you've drawn, but at least you suggest for a discussion here this evening. So let me take them. First of all, uh, I was a very small child when our maid was Teresa, and uh, I, I love Teresa. Teresa at the time, and I'm speaking for the benefit of our listeners, uh, before the Second World War, when indeed... Uh, even Winston Churchill was saying nice things, if you can believe it, about uh, Adolf Hitler. Because the fact that Adolf Hitler uh, had been putting his, I think we will have to admit, considerable gifts to evil purpose, and also the fact that he was in certain respects quite mad, in my judgment, uh, had not as yet come to light, at least over here it hadn't come to light. Although I must say that my father uh, was a very perceptive man. And when I was listening to uh, Adolf Hitler over the, the old Emerson that my mother won in a raffle at our Paris church uh, with, with uh, Teresa, and my father saw the influence that the man was having on me as well as on millions of others, he did take me aside and he told me uh, what I've just said, that Hitler was indeed evil, that he would, one of these days, probably sooner than rather than later, loose again upon the world. We were not that far from the First World War, the ravages of war. And he uh, forbade me to continue to listen. And, of course, I continued, and the matter came to a head. I think it came, the, the, the real catalyst was when he came back and found the mailbox filled with uh, Nazi propaganda, which was really addressed to Teresa. And uh, that was sort of the end of Teresa. But I did listen. And anyone who has, for example, seen Lenny Riefenstahl's uh, motion picture, uh, Triumph of the Will, uh, will know that even on mature adults, that sort of thing can have an effect. And I was a little child. Then, as to the Pledge of Allegiance to the Flag, when I uh, showed that chapter to my wife, she said, you know, why do you bother to mention that? And I said, well, I think it's significant. And she said, well, you know, you went to the parochial school, and that's the way you pledged allegiance to the flag, which, you know, we did, too, in that period of time. Uh, that was the way, at the time, that one pledged allegiance. And true enough, that was uh, virtually an exact duplicate of the salute being used in uh, Spain, uh, Italy, and uh, Nazi Germany, but it really was based upon that of ancient Rome, and I, and I, and I know you know that. And, however, to, to uh, be fair about it, I did enjoy it, as I say in the book, and indeed, uh, when uh, Nazi Germany became to be revealed for what it was, and I was at another parochial school, they said, well, now turn your palm over 
you know, we're not going to do it with the palm down anymore. Turn it over. And everybody dutifully turned it over. I didn't. I kept it mine down because I did. that was the way one, one, one did the flag. Uh, race. Now we're getting to something, uh, or genetics, uh, more properly, as you, as you put it. We're getting to something that concerned me much later on. Uh, you may be aware that, that, that the great flyer Lindbergh, who flew the solo Atlantic flight, was quite similarly concerned when he chose his wife and wrote about it. And I was, and uh, you, you expressed a wonderment about mathematics. I uh, know enough math to be able to navigate an airplane, but I, I never really was satisfied with my ability at math. And I was not, as you uh, uh, know from having read about my younger years, uh, at all happy with uh, my frame, my bone structure and what have you. I do believe that uh, certain groups of people such as the the, uh, the Germans, the Teutons, have demonstrated over the years uh, considerable accomplishment, and I think that means something. And uh, it may not surprise you that I feel, for example, that uh, Jews, as a result of 6,000 years of persecution and resistance to assimilation, that those who have survived both persecution and, assim and assimilation uh, must be acknowledged to be a superior genetic pool. Uh, I found myself attracted to, uh, to those qualities, and so I sought them in my wife. And uh, indeed, I found a, a young lady who was uh, Teutonic and Celtic and who, when I would sit down and do crossword puzzles, to amuse myself, I discovered she would sit down and do differential calculus. And I said to myself, you know, that's really what, you're, what you've been looking for. Then to move on to, to other things, all of which have been uh, telescoped. Uh, the discussion with Attorney General Mitchell at the time you mentioned was dealing with how we were going to cope with the violent protestors we expected at the San Diego Convention. You're going to get Abby Hoffman and Jerry Rubin or people like that. You were going to drug them. Not so much Abby Hoffman or Jerry Rubin. What, what, what we were More threatening than, we than were, those. No, we were concerned posers. with those who were, at the time, putting out uh, calls for uh, people to show up there by the thousands. And, and at disrupt the, same the time, convention. Well, do more than that. They were distributing booklets, which had been printed in Brazil, we found, which were do-it-yourself manuals for the construction of pipe bombs uh, with nails wrapped around them and, and, and uh, what we used to call Molotov cocktails, uh, things like that, violent people. And what we proposed to do was a variation on what my uncle had told me the Texas Rangers used to do in a riot. They would linger on the sidelines and identify the leaders go in and take the leaders out, and then the crowd would be much more uh, leaderless crowd. You were going to take these leaders we out. We were going take to take them, them out, take them down to Mexico, keep them, for keep them there until after the convention, and then turn them loose. We did not intend to kill them. But when the attorney general then said to me, uh, well, you know, these people that, that you say you've got lined up for, for this uh, in your special action group, which is the way it was listed in English on the chart, uh, what makes you think that they can accomplish something like that? Then I repeated to him, what Mr. Hunt had said to me of them, that indeed among them they had uh, accounted for 22 already, and including two hanged in a garage from a beam. And uh, w when I started to explain the group, I knew that uh, Magruder, who was president, uh, present, and, and Dean, who were present, were too young to uh, understand what I was going to say. And, of course, it was a gross exaggeration. But I wanted to make a point. Maybe I was being a bit sarcastic. So I said to the Attorney General, who was an officer in the Second World War, and I knew would understand the point I was going to make, I said, an Einsatzgruppe General. And you and I know that that was the, the group of uh, uh, killers used to take the lives of uh, enemies of the Reich, is the way they were uh, described in those days, principally Jews, but also gypsies, Catholics, and what have you. And... Those events, you see, when you telescope them, might make you think, and certainly as I sit here and telescope them again in, in this broadcast, might make you think that I was preoccupied with things Germanic, 
I, I don't think I was, but certainly they, uh, these things which formed such strong impressions on my life because I lived through those times uh, are things that, that, that have affected me. Now, you mentioned again Nietzsche, and I'm going to disagree with you a little bit. I, I would not translate Übermensch into Superman. After all, in German, we have the word super for super. I would say superior man. I don't know what to say to you other than I thought that one ought to approach marriage intelligently, and if these were the, if these were the corrections I wanted to make in myself and to extend to my children, then it was logical that I seek such a mate, just as Mr. Lindbergh, or Colonel Lindbergh, felt the same way. The reason I've pressed it in this direction is not that I want to say, you know, you are given merely to philo uh, Teutonism, and that is the key to your character. It is not. But rather that you have found in the German tradition long before Nazism arose. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you found in the European tradition, or the Central European, or wherever um, it is lost. The sense of Ordnung. Um, uh, the sense the, of Ordnung, yeah. of order, and uh, inevitably a view of life in which it is seen as a hard struggle. There's a Darwinian yeah, tone there, to yes, it. There, there is social Darwinism there, yes. Exactly. And it's interesting to me, and this is uh, uh, the very title of your book yes. recalls a sort of a German resonance. Uh, the Nazis and Nietzsche before them and lots of others before them carried on a good deal about will. Eisener Villa, the iron will of Absolutely. the true soldier of the prince. Well, I, the I heard such speeches state. made as a child. Yes. And it seems to me that when you went over to Creep, and took on the secret uh, intelligence operation for them under the cover of your being uh, a legal counsel for the organization, you brought a, a world view which you can justify, and you did the last time we talked, uh, in terms of the interactions between states, which are necessarily amoral and involve using all the dirty tricks and playing all the hardball you can. You brought that worldview to domestic American politics, and thereby, and insisting that the equation was absolutely obvious, uh, you thereby began, using your iron will, you began to formulate a conception of how to run that election, or your part of that election campaign, that's, that's so. which was, I think, finally destructive of, or at least uh, tended to undermine, the provenance and the pertinence of uh, those values which still sort of guide the American domestic well, political the, yeah, process. Now, now I think you're, you're, you're really coming to this the is the argument of we had. disagreement. This we're, is the we're, argument we're we're we right had back. last time. We're right back where we yeah. were last time. And yes. before we get back to it for uh, yet uh, uh, a deja vu, right. we've got to stop and take care of some commercials. But when, after that, let's talk then about the actual development of Gemstone and, of course, about the Watergate break-in. Sure. And I do want to press you as well now for some details and some revelations that you couldn't make last time. Certainly. But let's examine all of that in terms of overall philosophy about man sure. in relation to institutions and the combat between institutions. Certainly. Sir. That's where we are, I think, in our I, inquiry. I, I think that's where we are, and I think that's a good place to be. Right back after this. The autobiography of and by G. Gordon Liddy is titled simply Will. It is just published by St. Martin's Press, and it is a document of our time. It is superbly written, and I've rarely over recent years, read a book of greater interest, and uh, Thank you, sir. I certainly want to commend it to all who are listening. Gemstone yes. is the operation you designed. We all know, and we even knew before this book was published, because it's been recounted in so many other books, uh, we knew about how you shaped up the original plan for a budget of a million dollars, brought it to Mitchell with Magruder and Dean sitting by in the Attorney General's office, uh, Mitchell's taciturn response in between puffs on his uh, omnipresent pipe was, um, go back and whittle it down. Uh, it's too much. Too we much need money. something cheaper. You went and uh, worked it out for about half a million, dropping some of the operations. Finally, they sort of approved about a quarter of a million. Correct. Um, can we talk about if only in quick review, the main elements of Operation Gemstone, oh, yes, yes, okay. and keeping in mind as well the issue that I've raised in this rather yes. contentious way, oh. uh, perhaps you can demonstrate to me that the worldview I'm projecting onto you did not have much to do with the shaping of Operation Gemstone. Well, I... I or I, perhaps it did. I, I've got to agree with you there. I mean, I, Gemstone uh, was the overall term. Uh, under it... We had uh, the various code words. Ruby was the code word for uh, agents who would penetrate uh, the other camp. Uh, uh, then we had 
Diamond, which was the whole um, operation by which we would try to counter those demonstrators. Topaz were the uh, penetrations for photographic mission purposes. Uh, Opals were the actual... uh, Entries, the bag jobs themselves. This was Opals one through, through four. four as that, I that was yeah. The, the plan provided for four, and that was why. Opals what were those four? four? Uh, we were going to we, we were going to have uh, originally uh, the Muskie headquarters. You see, it depend when, when we first designed it. Uh, what happened? We got overtaken by events, really, uh, Milt. And, and but we're going to have the the uh, the Muskie headquarters and the McGovern headquarters and. Uh, they were going to be black bag. They were going to be searched right. for and, what? And they were going to be... Well, what I wanted to do... Uh, maybe we better go back even further. My concept, what I thought I had been uh, given a charter to do, was just to produce the intelligence, uh, meaning the product. Uh, it was thereafter that I was told that I would have to draw up all these charts and flow charts and cash flow and all of this kind of business, which really... Uh, is not what one does when one engages in this kind of activity. But uh, my superiors wanted it, so I would have to go through it. Ordinarily, one expects carte blanche, I guess. Well, carte blanche, the idea being, if you have sufficient confidence in me to uh, have me engage in this kind of activity for that kind of a budget, uh, then you ought to let me do it and and let let me uh, get you the information. Uh, If you don't, then get somebody else in whom you do. Maybe don't go around and, and, and treat this as if, as if we're uh, going to have a campaign to sell pantyhose. Uh, that's not the way it, it works. And I resented that, and indeed I still do, to be honest with you. Uh, but that was, that was what I found myself stuck with. So uh, we went down. We had, we had all these different uh, really usual, not unusual, usual in terms of the clandestine services of uh, activities. And uh, I presented them in what I hoped was a uh, a very straightforward and rational way to explain them to people whom I uh, had now come to believe uh, didn't understand that sort of thing, except that I really thought that John Mitchell knew a lot more about it than apparently he did. So, the business of... of uh, my worldview, my worldview is that uh, human beings, however we might hope someday that the meek might inherit the earth, as the Bible tells us, that uh, all kinds of wonderful things with respect to human beings may be expected when the millennium is upon us. And you know, the, the, the professors of the Jewish faith are, are still waiting for the Messiah, and, the, and the, the professors of the Christian faith are still waiting for uh, Christ to appear once again. And I'm sure other parallels and other faiths can be found. The fact of the matter is that none of those events has as yet taken place, and uh, the meek uh, have not, and in my opinion, shall not indeed inherit the earth. I believe uh, that the power of panzers exceeds that of prayer. But don't you think, we come to the same issue we had last time. Yes, we do. Inevitably, we do. uh, I find at least one way to illustrate it, uh, just drawing one small portion of Operation Gemstone. Part of the original plan was to go down to the Democratic Convention in Miami, and among many other things, you would also discredit the opponents, discredit their nominee, uh, as it it looked as if George McGovern in the weeks before the convention was going to indeed get that nomination. Part of the plan was to get a lot of fake hippies. I don't know where, maybe you're going to get them from Central no, Casting these was, or something. No, these are supposed to be sort. real hippies. Matter of fact, I think I make that point in the book. That, well, but they were going to be somehow when your employer at least managed in our, yes, in your Yes, correct. Employee. Real hippies, but in our employer. And you're going to get them to look and behave as offensively as possible correct. and to surround McGovern with them, thus saying to the nation, uh, and they were, of course, going to be making strong supportive noises for yes. George McGovern, and thus this would say to the nation, that's the kind of man, and those are the kinds of values that George McGovern really represents. That is not going after secret intelligence about what no, the opposition is going to do no, a different, with regard to programs and policies. Right. That's a different level of, of, of campaign. And it traduces and destroys and it's, the possibility for the democratic process to operate at all. It's, it's right out of the last hurrah. It's right out of Dick Tuck with his chi- uh, signs over Richard Nixon's head in Chinatown. I mean, it's just, it's just so routine. It's okay. It, 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 
it's, it's the way the game is played. It's the way the game is played, indeed. Uh, and you know, I uh, uh, I have not had too many interviews about this book yet. This is one of the, one of the early ones, and I'm sure this is going to be one of the best, no matter how many more I have. But of the ones that I've had so far, uh, and of all the different things in the book that, that people have, have pointed out, they point out things like that. No one uh, says, what about the fact that John Sirica's concept of setting the record straight was to adulterate it, to change it, to alter it materially, and to indeed, in, a, in another uh, instance, have a cover-up of his own. And I'll, t- I'll tell you why I think that is so. Is it because it depends upon whose ox is being gored? You see, John Sirica does it, it's okay, because he's a good guy. If I do it, it's, it's, uh, it's bad, because I'm, I'm cast in the, in the role of the Messerschmitt rather than the, the Spitfire. Uh, the reason I say that is not because it shocks me, but is to comment upon the fact that it shocks you. It's just the way uh, it is. This is not to say that you and I and everybody else uh, might not wish it were otherwise. I'm sure Jimmy Carter wishes it otherwise, but Lord help us, I, I expect next week for him to get up and tell the American people that now that winter has passed, spring has arrived, and if the roots aren't damaged, the garden will grow. The ultimate test and expression of your strong will, apart from the many excruciating uh, challenges you've put yourself through, but the ultimate test of your will was that you clammed up and said nothing about Watergate after the whole thing exploded and you were discovered to be pretty much in the middle. You were discovered to be the man who ran the operation. Only now for the first time have you said anything about Watergate. And one must, if only grudgingly, honor uh, the standard uh, by which uh, you made that decision, which was you did not want to incriminate any others and make others suffer because of information that you had revealed. Yes. Uh, and I understand that the publication of this book was delayed until the statute of limitations That's had run right. out and yeah. uh, a phalanx of lawyers had assured you that nothing you said in this book Would could put cause... Would put the liberty of anybody else. Right. <clears throat> but now you're free to talk. Yes. <clears throat> uh, I don't know how in the world I've managed to get this far in this conversation without really asking you anything about Watergate. But now <laughs> I want to. Okay. Um, who ultimately conceived and ordered Watergate? It's clear that Jeb Magruder told you that uh, a, a break in uh, to the Democratic National Committee headquarters would probably be desirable, and he pounded the side of his desk saying where he kept his secret documents about the opposition, and he said, I want to know what O'Brien has in his desk drawer about us. Yeah. Well, no. But Jeb Magruder was not the ultimate source of no, these decisions. I, I, think, I, would think. I think, Milt, that we ought to make clear when we're discussing this for the benefit of our listeners. Uh, which we're referring to, Watergate 1 or Watergate 2. As, as, it so often is, is forgotten that there were two Watergate break-ins. Well, Watergate 2 was to go uh, rearrange yeah, well, that, yeah, the... But this, there was a significant change in my judgment All between right. the, the, the motivating thing there. I mean, uh, something occurred. Uh, the, the first one was to go in and implant two kinds of devices. One, an electronic surveillance device. Uh, that would, for example, uh, <clears throat> transmit out of this room everything that is being said, much as if we left one of these microphones here open and other people came in and thought they were off. The other was a transmitter on the telephone, uh, in, which was supposed to be in, in uh, Mr. O'Brien's office, so that the other end of the conversation could also be transmitted, something the first device couldn't. And the, the devices were intended to be left there because it was our anticipation that after the Democratic Convention and the nominee had been uh, decided, that then that same handsome suite of offices, which was then available, would become indeed the, the nerve center, you see. So we thought that that made sense, and that made sense to me. This is Watergate 1. Watergate 1 is what we're talking about now. By the way, who ordered it, do you think? Magruder was conveying Cr- somebody Magruder else's was clearly, intention. Yeah, I mean, I think I uh, knew Magruder by that point pretty well, and I could tell when Magruder was being Magruder or when Magruder was conveying orders. He, and uh, it was clear to me that he was uh, relaying an order. Uh, I don't know with certitude, because I wasn't there when he received the orders, from whom he received them. Now, one of the things you will notice, Milt, in the book throughout uh, what I do is I lay out everything I know and that I did and what I saw and what I heard. The one thing I don't do is speculate. You know, you won't find anything that who I think caused the eighteen and a half minute gap or who I thought. Well, that's why I'm asking you this now. Right. You don't speculate. The reason I, I don't I speculate do is right because I addressed this 
task, uh, not only as an autobiography, but uh, in, in what I hoped would be a scholarly way, recognized that really what I am is a primary source, that indeed I'm probably disqualified from writing any kind of a definitive history uh, because I cannot uh, muster the disinterest necessary, the detachment, the s scholarly view. So I was creating here the primary source. So I deliberately refrained from speculation because I don't think it belongs in there. Uh, and, and I would hope that you as, as, as a, uh, uh, a scholar would agree with me. Now, the other objection I have to it is that suppose I just think that it was John Doe and I come out here and I tell you... you know, How you about John Mitchell instead of John Doe? Yeah, no, but, but whatever. And I, I broadcast that individual's name to, to what you and I know as a, as a... Where do I get off doing that? I mean, he, I might be wrong. <clears throat> you see what I mean? Sure, and I can accept that. You really don't know and you've got some speculations. Yeah, and I don't, and I don't, don't want to say something I don't know. When I know, I tell you. And, and that's what I do in this book. I mean, I, I lay it right out there. Let me tell you one thing I know. This is WGN Clear Channel Radio from Chicago. What was the difference between Watergate 1 and Watergate 2? All right, be between the two, when, when, uh, when the, the, what we call the take, the information was coming in from Watergate 1, and it was clearly not was it, uh, been expected by anybody. The bugs including, weren't working as well me. as they should also. Well, what, what I went to, to McCord and I said, you know, uh, why are we getting this and not getting that? And he said, we have a technical problem. He said, either of one of, of two situations obtain. Either we have a defective transmitter or the transmitter is so positioned that its signal is being masked, blocked off. Now, for the benefit of our listeners, let me describe the kind of equipment and, and what the problem uh, was. The transmitters, both of them, were designed to transmit in an exceptionally narrow band. I'm getting a little technical now, but I think you know what I'm talking about. That was point one. So narrow that it would take the aid of a very expensive tuner, indeed equipped with an oscilloscope, to even locate that band. And then you had a band spreader to spread it. The second thing, uh, uh, thing that was done to protect this was to transmit a very weak signal. We only had to go across the street. And that's just about as far as that would carry. Because of that, if you put it behind a steel beam, you aren't going to hear it 20, 20 feet away. So McCord said, that's our problem. I then reported that to my superiors through on the one side, Mr. Magruder, and indeed when I was called to the White House itself by uh, Gordon Strawn, who was on the staff of uh, Mr. Haldeman, uh, and uh, the same question was put to me, I gave the same answer. All right, it, it was then uh, decided and conveyed to me through uh, Mr. Magruder that we would have a quick fix in and out. All we had to worry about was having McCord go in there. McCord assured me that this was just, you know, a couple of minutes and bang, everything would be taken care of. And that was a discussion. Then, all of a sudden, at that meeting, Magruder started to question me about the interior of the office. And, and where are the files located? How many files are there? What kind of locks do they have on them? All this sort of business. None of which made any sense in terms of a quick fix in the electronic stuff. And he, and he seemed to be becoming more and more agitated as, as he... Uh, went on, and finally there was that scene which you have just told our listeners, so yeah. I won't repeat about I've, slapping the I've desk. I've misplaced it. And that, that was on the had, second one. That had great significance to me, because it was from there that he was always taking whatever he had of a derogatory nature against the Democrats, and it was quite clear to me, and uh, I maintain that position to this day, that what he wanted, when he then ordered this massive photographic mission, which was going to take hours, and uh, a completely different situation, that what we were to do was, in effect, to acquire whatever, if anything, the Democrats had of a derogatory nature against us and w would be presumed to be ready to employ against us in a similar fashion. So the focus shifted from... Yes, sir. Uh, and very quickly... From office talk and telephone talk, which was going to be electronically picked up, yes. uh, to um, maybe getting the equipment working well so you could get that talk, yeah. but also let's it. get documents from the spoken word to the written word. Yes, exactly. A common interpretation, which we've had in a number of earlier volumes, mm -hmm. uh, is that what they were most concerned about was what O'Brien had in his desk or yeah. elsewhere about the Hughes loan or gifts 
to Richard Nixon. Yes, and, uh, as and, and mediated I, through I, I've seen proposal. that speculated, and I and I will uh, address that if you want. Uh, one of the things they talk about so much, and there was so much chit chat about at the time, was the the loan, which was really to the brother. I think it was Donald, Donald or, Nixon. Yeah, yeah, Donald Nixon. And uh, I had a conversation with. Uh, Mr. Robert Bennett, who was the then employer of Howard Hunt in what was a CIA front. And as he pointed out, he said, I don't know, I don't know why the, the interest in that. He said that the fact of the matter is there was a profit made by Mr. Hughes on that loan. I mean, there's no problem there. And the other thing that I would suggest to you is that uh, in terms of the contributions which were made, when you look at the total, just lump it all together, that uh, Howard Hughes made to the Nixon cause, it was peanuts when put beside that of, say, uh, Mr. Clement Stone. And so, again, I think really all the all the attention there is, is almost a reflection of the obsession or the panache, if you will, of the mystery of the, of, of the reclusive Mr. Hughes. I don't think that that makes much sense. I think they wanted it all. Uh, I don't think they even knew what was there. I think they wanted it all so they could see if there was anything there. And if so, they wanted to be able to prepare for... Uh, because after all, we weren't to take it, we were to photograph it. I think that there is a non-conspiratorial interpretation that may well apply. Um, yes, I agree with you. They probably didn't know what they were after. They were after whatever they could get. And that non Well, they were told just to photograph it and bring it back. I mean, these Cuban fellows were not asked to go in there and make these assessments. You know, the, the product was, was, was to be taken, and, and our superiors would evaluate it. I think the Watergate plan and Watergate II, and more broadly, the whole intelligence operation that you were put in charge of, uh, was as much as anything due to the activation of what might be labeled the Matterhorn Complex. You climb the mountain because it's there. Similarly, you uh, develop a potential for doing this sort of intelligence, or rather you d decide to do this sort of intelligence because the potential is there. And what really got the whole thing started was the fact that they set up an intelligence division within the committee to re-elect the president. Once you've got one, and then once you put a sharp and aggressive young guy in charge of it, namely G. Gordon Liddy, he's bound to come up with a plan, and then you've got to go ahead, even though you really don't want to, and even though maybe your deeper instincts tell you it's a dangerous commitment. Once you're rolling, and once there's an advocate for that which has been more or less temporarily mandated, uh, you can't get out of it. Uh, events are in the saddle, and uh, commitment and career are driving the, uh, not the principles, but those who work for the principles, using your vocabulary, are driving them on toward the completion of their mission. So then you invent justifications for the mission. Well, um, certainly there are, there, there, there are the, the data there uh, to support the thesis. I, I can even add to the data, if you will, uh, by recalling to your attention uh, the fact that Prior to the time John Dean recruited me, uh, this marvelous bit of irony that nobody seems to have picked up on uh, for this uh, this task, I had seen a scheme called Sand Wedge, you may recall from the, the literature of the day, which had been worked out uh, by John Caulfield, who was at the time in the employ of Mr. Dean. And it had uh, a half-million-dollar budget, and it specifically had a number of the things which later on were amongst those which were in the gemstone plan, and it had been rejected as inadequate, and I knew that. And now here comes Dean to me, uh, uh, pitching me, if you will, on this thing. That, that was one of the reasons that I was so annoyed in those meetings with Mitchell, and as I expressed it at the time, I said, you people are putting me in the posture of a salesman selling something uh, that you recruited me for, that, that presumably was pre-sold. I mean, it, 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 you know, I resented that. Uh, now, on. certainly also, I must say that I was or am uh, an aggressive individual. I was given a task to do, and I wanted to do it. I certainly wanted a decision, one way or the other. And we, we had all these people out here. We had all this stuff going. And uh, the, the absence of a decision was a distinct embarrassment to me. These people were not used to indecisiveness. 
Uh, are you signaling me that, that uh, oh, you are signaling me. Okay, you get me wound up and then you cut me off. You're a devil. Go ahead. Sorry for that, old friend. <laughs> I'm signaling you that everybody's signaling me that I'm ten minutes late for commercials. So fast. Who is ultimately responsible for this? We'll take care of those commercials. We're also late for telephone calls, of course, okay. and I trust our listeners will forgive me because there's yet a little bit more material I want to develop in dialogue before we get on to the phone. Yes, but indeed. it's time to give the phone number, which is, as usual, 591-7200. The lines are open, 591-7200. Right back to G. Gordon Liddy, author of the new book, Will, published by St. Martin's, right after these words. Here's Milt Rosenberg. Thank you very much, George Bauer. Gordon, what a... What a frustrating situation this is. Obviously, I could go on putting questions to you for the next five hours, but our listeners want to put questions to you, and they deserve that, of course. And I, again, ask them to forgive me if I linger just a bit longer. There are one or two things I'd like to take care of. I haven't yet, except, well, I guess I adverted to it earlier, but I haven't pressed you on it. Uh, But the question of your uh, plans to kill at least two people that you mentioned, uh, Jack Anderson and then Howard Hunt. Uh, Much has been made of that in the newspaper accounts of your uh, television appearances and uh, some of the reviews or commentary on the book. Uh, Are those two sort of exceptional and aberrant uh, incidents in your career in Washington, or do they reflect other kinds of plans that you shaped at other times? Well, no, uh, there was was the earlier situation, uh, which I discuss in the book, uh, when I was involved very heavily in the massive problem of, of uh, serious drug abuse, I'm talking about hard drugs, heroin. And this is when you were with the Treasury Department. Yeah, and and uh, to, to some extent, when I was when I was in the White House too, this was some of my task. When I was in the White House, I still had responsibilities in that area and in the area of, uh, I guess, gun control. You'd call it things like that. Uh, I took the position at meetings, much to the horror of persons in the Department of State, that those so-called drug barons who were outside the United States, not reachable by process or anything else, who were pumping the heroin across our borders, almost directly into the veins of our children, should be seen for what they are, which is the killers of American children. And as in as much as they could be presumed to uh, going to be per- persist in this conduct that we ought to go out and uh, take their lives and I made that proposal it was not accepted uh, I recall uh, a conversation I think which we discuss in the book or I discuss in the book in which Richard Helms for example said you know when you're talking about the golden triangle area up there in Burma we could rough those people up a bit, but, you know, they are really not responsive to the central government of Burma at all. If I had been sitting in White House councils and heard that proposal, I also would have rejected it. But uh, whether I would or not doesn't matter. There's clearly a difference between that and advocating and planning assassination as part of the American domestic political process. Well, all right. Uh, Jack Anderson, Anderson was yeah. hostile to the White House, and you did indeed feel that he had broken something in his column which revealed the identity of an American CIA well, agent the information and endangered that man. And yeah. for that, you advocated yeah. uh, no, the information staging a, to us. a killing on the streets of Washington yeah. and the disguising it as a The information brought to us was that uh, the, the culmination of, of uh, Anderson's activities at the time highly dangerous to the to the uh, damaging to the foreign policy of the United States was that he had identified and been responsible for the execution or the imminent execution uh, after torture of an American intelligence source abroad which incidentally just a couple of days ago Mr. Hunt uh, narrowed down to in the Middle East I think he said is where the, the source was and I want to make it very important uh, point that he could be expected to continue this behavior because uh, this sort of thing is clearly not called for in the spirit of vengeance it's 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 preventive surgery if you will and the uh, the way i put it was uh, how many of our people must we let him kill this way before we kill him and uh the other part of your question I would address by saying it is not that unusual. There is the precedent which has been now revealed of during the days uh, when uh, Sir William Stephenson was operating as intrepid in this country and the British Secret Service killed uh, an American citizen. Well, we've never done it. Bill Colby sat once in the very chair you're sitting in now and assured me that the CIA has never assassinated anybody in its whole long history. All right. Uh... 
It was it, it, I, true. I cannot point to an individual uh, here in the United States other than the case of that chap. Uh, you'll recall the the person who uh, went uh, with a problem of conscience to the to the Catholic priest out in the West Coast, who said that uh, he had participated in a slaying, and I think it was, as I recall it, it was very close in description to the method suggested to me in 1972 by the CIA doctor with the automobile. Do you recall that? Do you recall yeah, what I'm talking LSD about? LSD on the steering no, wheel. No, no. The, the, the business of, of striking the vehicle. I think they ran the yes. fellow down uh, mm-hmm. like that. No, not the LSD on the steering wheel. Because the CIA doctor said, look, our experience with that is that it's so unpredictable. I but thought I'd I, get a horse laugh out of you when I told you that Bill Colby assured me that the CIA has never assassinated anybody. Yeah, well, but I've, you're playing uh, it very cool. Well, you know, one tries to. Listen, now, I've got to put a last general okay. question to you. Um, and then we must get to the phones. You've had a long time now to contemplate it. You had some hard time in prison mm-hmm. during which you were thinking about all that had gone before in mm-hmm. your life. And uh, you've now had that wonderful uh, opportunity to kind of re-examine your life, which is available if you do mm-hmm. a serious and honest autobiography, yeah. which you have certainly done. Very simple question. Mm-hmm. Any regrets? I don't mean regrets about tactics. I mean regrets about lifestyle and commitment. Uh, not about lifestyle and commitment, no. Um, certainly, uh, I regret uh, the error. It was an error of, of uh, employing McCord as I did when I ought not to have. And uh, certainly, I regret whatever failures, whatever uh, ventures of mine in the past have failed. I would rather they, that they have succeeded. But lifestyle and commitment, no. I, I have always tried to, to live as I believed I ought. And uh, I, I guess uh, in a, it, it's still a bit early to, uh, to know whether or not uh, I shall succeed fully and finally. But uh, Would you believe still that the proper function oh, for a man like you is to be a good soldier of the prince? But you better find a prince who's ruthless enough as your prince was not quite. I'd say that's a pretty good summary. Yeah. Well, then it's a moment to pause, another round of commercials, and then we'll let all those people in on the conversation who are now clamoring to get in. Right. Five nine one seventy two hundred. Right back after these words. Again, here's Milt Rosenberg on extension seven twenty. With thanks to George Bauer, and we return to G. Gordon Liddy, and we are drawing tonight, of course, from the content of his rich autobiography titled simply Will. W-I-L-L, just published by St. Martin's Press. 591-7200, and on to the telephones. Here's the first caller. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, I'm an attorney, practicing attorney. I have read but only the review, as in Time magazine, and I have heard uh, prior interviews and also the uh, Channel 7 television interview the other morning in which Jack Anderson and Liddy came together. I have the comment of my main concern, please, and then I'll get to a question, is regarding how many more, in my opinion, misguided souls like you, Mr. Liddy, are still working with the U.S. government. That's my big concern. Um, I hope I, a host of them. Well, I, I have the question. I'll jump right on. To, to, to get my full question, I'll tell you, I'm a, a free thinker. I'm, a, I suppose, a humanist of a sort. I don't know precisely what it all means, but... I am con- very, I'm concerned, very concerned uh, to know what is your position regarding church and God and philosophy, and how do you cope with uh, concerned atheists, concerned free thinkers, whether they be our people or internationally located? Yes. Can you comment on that? I, I, I certainly will, sir. It's an excellent question. Uh, as I point out in, in, in the book, I was raised uh, a Roman Catholic in a, in, a, in a kind of Roman Catholicism which I, I really don't think exists anymore uh, post uh, the Vatican II Council. However, I am not now a, a practicing Catholic. Indeed, I, I don't think I could even be called a practicing Christian. I think probably the most accurate uh, assessment of my view would be that I am an, an agnostic rather than an atheist. And the way I cope with it, uh, w- with others, is, is simply to say it's their business, uh, not mine, what they believe or what they don't believe. On the agnostic, I think, of course, 
by definition, all of us, in fact, are agnostics. That is, by definition, no one knows, and you are either a believer uh, of Well, I would agree with you, but there's an awful lot of people... and be an atheist. There's an awful lot of people who think they know, and, uh, sir, in my own opinion, probably in the history of the world, more blood has been spilled on the ground in the name of God by persons who were absolutely convinced that they knew the one way and and by God everybody else was going to go their way or they were going to die for it. Let me check something with the caller. Sir, let me get clear on the basis for your question. Or is there implicit in your question this notion that if Mr. Liddy in fact were still uh, committed to any significant uh, uh, organized religion, he could not have undertaken the sort of career that he's had. I am wondering if that might have been there. I am wondering if, as old, for instance, uh, the um, the wealthy Ohio millionaire who tried, uh, who did deal with the Russians for years and tried to get our Senate years back to uh, uh, deal more with them, but the Senate apparently came up with something uh, to the effect that, oh, they don't want to deal much with those atheists. Uh, I forget the gentleman's name. That's Cyrus Eaton, Cyrus I think Eaton. you're talking yes, about. Yes, he did a lot of dealing with oh, well. it. Well, now I'm just concerned. This remark that uh, had you been instructed by uh, the FBI uh, uh, superior of yours, you would have not called J. Edgar Hoover to verify it. I, I think this is entirely different than to believe from Hunt that Jack Anderson had killed even, caused to be killed or tortured even an informant. I feel that you were very seriously used, and I'm sorry to hear it. Uh, how how is your position on that? Well, my, my, my position is that, that I, I I was not accepting uh, Hunt's word on on uh, something that Hunt uh, uh, developed. Hunt did not propose that he had developed. Hunt said that this has this is what has been afforded me by our uh, superiors, and uh, they were certainly in a position to know. And there is the presumption of regularity there. But it was Sir, forwarded me, to with... you. I'm sorry. I really feel that they were using you and giving you something and wondering what you might come up with, knowing your nature to be blunt and brutal and whatnot. The, the notion is they were using G. Gordon yes. Liddy as an instrument yes. or a weapon rather yes. than as a colleague. Absolutely. Well, uh, uh, I disagree with you, but you're saying well, that you're being opinion. used. I think it was sad. Well, sir, we thank you for yes. the call. You're welcome. And we will yep. dash on to another. Hello, you're on the air. Yes, good evening, Milt, and you're forgiven. <laughs> uh, Mr. Liddy's a very interesting man, and I'm happy you let us through it all tonight. Uh, and Mr. Liddy, I'm uh, sitting here looking at Maurice Stan's book, which was entitled The Terrors of Justice, which perhaps uh, you read. Yes. And in reference to you, uh, you, he said, Sensing bigger stakes, federal judge John Sirica handed out outrageous, uh, outrageous provisional prison terms of 35 years to Hunt, 20 years and a huge fine to Liddy, and 40 years to the other. Uh I'm a little surprised if you do not believe in the duplicity of James McCord, uh, as I always have. Uh, what do you think led Judge Sirica to sense bigger stakes? Well, well, first of all, my, my sentence was not a provisional one. It was a final one. Uh, well, I'm, I was just quoting from yeah, yeah, I, I understand that. Uh, no, I don't believe that uh, James McCord was a double agent. I, I do not. Um uh, uh, That's I, the interpretation that he was working somehow for the CIA yeah, to bring the whole operation down yes, and, and lead to its yeah. You know, I, uh, right, right after, right after uh, the Ehrlichman, was, the Ehrlichman thesis. Yeah, but, but uh, I, I just disagree with it completely. I, uh, I was in the cell with him for seven days, and uh, in which he was absent only, only a little bit of the time when I guess he was visited by his lawyer or what have you, and. Uh, uh, in conversation with him constantly and uh, in order to answer your, uh, your your question no I don't believe that he was uh, we don't have time here to go into all, all of the various reasons why I don't subscribe to this that or the other uh, conspiratorial theory I, I think that that uh, probably John Sirica did not believe that somebody uh, who was a law review graduate from law school and a former uh, supervisor of the FBI and all the other things I'd been had gone off on his own and in effect misappropriated the funds of his client and employer and, and, and done something for which uh, uh, no one above him was responsible. I mean, I, I think that Judge Sirica drew that conclusion and it's not an unreasonable conclusion for him to have drawn. Did you ever think of filing a, I don't know if this could have been done legally, but an appeal of that sentence, which, as Marie Stan says, the average man would have been given a suspended sentence, a good lecture by the judge, and sent home. 
I mean, it was simply breaking and entering. It was no more, no less than that. Well, the, the, we, we, uh, I filed uh, quite a few appeals, but uh, with, with respect to that sentence, when I even uh, 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 made a case, I thought, for a sentence reduction, and John Sirica became embarrassed by uh, the sentence that he had given me, uh, John Sirica uh, chose uh, uh, to adulterate the record, and I've got it right in the book and the proof right in the book. I mean, he, uh, he conducted a, a little bit of a cover-up of his own there. His idea of setting the record straight is just to corrupt it. Fascinating. Thank you very much. You thank welcome. you for the call, thank you, Milt. And on to another. Hello, you're on the air. Uh, yes, to Mr. Liddy. You draw our attention to certain nasty necessities of political life. Aren't those necessities better left off, uh, better left off concealed? Uh, and by that, I wonder if the effect of this political education you're offering the American public might not be further clamoring for weakening the FBI and the CIA than they already are and weakening that we can little ill afford. Uh, that would be a per perverse result. I would, hope the, uh, I would hope for exactly the opposite. But I guess the question is, might it not be an inadvertent or unintended result? Well, it might it not be an all-too-natural reaction on the part of the American public to... Well, I would hope react. not. I mean, we, we can no longer afford the, the luxury of illusion. Uh, we're just in a posture right now, in my judgment, of, of, of grave danger. And uh, I hope and, uh, uh, that, that we will uh, wake up in time. Sarah, I thank you for the call. Thank you. And a crucial word, this is WGN, Clear Channel Radio from Chicago. The number, 591-7200, and you are on the air. Good evening. You're moving fast tonight, Milton. Uh, I would first ask Mr. Liddy if he ever crossed paths or worked with William Rehnquist when they both were in the Justice Department. Second, if he has anything to add or that he particularly would like to repeat. In a very incisive article he wrote in Esquire magazine about prisons, which is something that I think is uh, interesting to draw out of him. And I have a per personal perspective on Jack Anderson and him at that time, if, if you're interested in half time. Well, uh, first of all, uh, no, I, I, I think I may have uh, perhaps met Mr. Rehnquist in the hall or something of that sort. Uh, but no, I, I, I could not say that I have uh, had worked with him uh, other than as part, perhaps, of, of, of a group effort in which he played a role, too. And I, I don't want to uh, make more of that than there is. There isn't that much more there. Uh, prisons, it's a fascinating thing. It's a microcosm. My Lord, uh, I could come out here and, and, and Milton and I could do a, a, a couple of shows on prisons. I was tempted in that direction because your chapters about your prison experience are, in fact, very, very significant for what they tell us about the way prisons operate and uh, the ways in which prisons break most but strengthen some few, and I think you were one of the, the latter. Yes, well, uh, there I think that, that Nietzsche was correct. Uh, in, in, uh, indeed, I said when I, when I left prison, to, what does not uh, destroy me makes me stronger. Uh, I, I don't know that we have the time to do justice to the subject uh, in, in, in response to that question. Next I, time we get you here. I, I'd love to. It'd be well worth doing if you're going to be back in Chicago soon. We'll do one on prisons. Fine. Would you say you have a comment about Jack Anderson, sir? Yes, I uh, crossed paths and, in fact, was working with uh, Jack Anderson and his staff on a story uh, during uh, the period that it turns out that uh, you were contemplating killing him. And uh, the perspective that I'd want to add, and I was very disappointed that it didn't come out during the interviews, was that, in fact, Jack Anderson and his staff were uh, gumshoeing with respect to a number of things, which smelled terribly wrong at that time about the Nixon administration. I'm not one who carries a hatchet uh, for Nixon, but there were a number of things which did not appear right, starting with the ITT contributions and the convention uh, in San Diego, and there were at least a dozen of them. And Jack Anderson and the staff, uh, give or take however you may think of them, were zeroing in on a number of things there. And I must say that at that time, a good uh, part of the American press was becoming quite timid, particularly as the uh, Nixon administration was taking sight on uh, two Washington Post TV stations down in, in, in uh, Florida. And I must say that what Mr. Liddy is, uh, has come to represent in his perception of really no effective limits to what government should do uh, was counterbalanced at that time by uh, a few journalists who were very concerned about what was going on, did not really have the range on it, and who really might have been up against far more danger than they realized. And what it suggests is in this country, like those broadcasts that Mr. Liddy, Liddy was listening to when he's uh, younger, that things can happen here and that it's very frightening to see people like Mr. Liddy in their position and how very few there are really like Jack Anderson who, when times get rough, 
will stand up. Uh, all right. My, my comment on that is is, is that in, in the entire uh, discussion of uh, killing Jack Anderson, there was absolutely nothing uh, about whatever uh, activities he might uh, or might not have engaged in that was politically embarrassing to the Nixon in, in investigation. Uh, it was just that it was, it was exactly and, uh, as wait. I it was exactly as, as I uh, put it in the book. The <coughs> other thing I want to say is that all that other stuff is subject to the logical fallacy post hoc ergo propter hoc. Well, Sir, wait a second. At that at that time, however, no. That, that, that what I'm what I'm really trying to say is having a you're very taking clear an memory, awfully long time saying it, sir. I, I, I'm, what I'm saying is, as as one with a clear memory from that very time about the sort of things that Jack Anderson was writing about, uh, he was really rubbing the administration raw in a number of areas, which in fact turned out to be scandalous. Well, let me l- let me reformulate what you're saying. I think what you were saying was that when uh, uh, Gordon uh, sat with Howard Hunt and the uh, CIA connected the doctor and they first talked about what to do about Anderson and that's where you kind of came up with the yeah. uh, uh, with the recommendation that we ought to just go kill this guy. Uh, that at that time he should have had in mind not only that Anderson may have uh, blown the cover of uh, a CIA agent and thus endangered him, but should have had in mind all the other things that Anderson had been doing in recent years and evaluated uh, the total quality of his public service or disservice and weighed the two against one another. That's close. And, and on that... To add to that, that, the fact that a man like Liddy could be within two miles of the White House is because there's kind of an infectious attitude which manifested itself. Two miles, hell, I was right areas. inside it. Well, sir, we thank you for the call. We've got the view, and uh, we do not have a meeting of minds here. But I'm curious about this. A few years ago, we took this program out of the country. We went to Canada for one special reason. Philip Agee was in Canada mm-hmm. and wanted to be interviewed but wasn't going to come into this country. Yeah. I think most of our listeners will remember he's the CIA former agent who has um, revealed the identities of hundreds of CIA agents in his two books uh, dedicated to just that purpose. If you and I uh, had known each other then, Gordon, and you still had some connections with CIA perhaps or with other uh, secret movers in Washington, would would you have tried to recruit me once I got A.G. alone in a small studio? Well, in, 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 indeed, in this book, I think uh, I, I quite explicitly say that uh, were I in a similar position uh, today, I would indeed agree to uh, terminate the life of Mr. A.G. Would you do it only on orders, or would you do it from your own no, will? No, I, 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 I am, have never and will never... Uh, arrogate to myself uh, the uh, taking of such decisions. But if you and I knew each other then, you might have got on the phone to Washington and said to some unidentified but important person at the opposite end, I know this guy who's going to see A.G. in uh, Canada, and maybe I can talk him into killing the man. Uh, yes, do I have a go-ahead from your office? Yeah, I, I might do that, yeah. Good Lord. I'm glad I didn't tell you at the time. <laughs> Five nine one seventy two hundred is the number. Back to the phones. Hello, you're on the air. Hello, uh, am I on? Yes, sir. Uh, first of all, I'd like to ask two things. Uh, did uh, Mr. Liddy read, uh, I'm sure he did, the Bernstein Woodward book? And uh, was there, does he believe there was ever such a person as Deep Zoda, or was this holding a big concoction? Okay, I, I, I did read the book. It was some time ago. Uh, from my reading of it, uh, it became my opinion that while uh, probably there was some informant who put uh, the gentleman through all that move the flower pot and go down the garage routine, that because of my uh, uh, understanding of the structuring of the Nixon White House, I don't believe that there was any one person who was in uh, a position to have access to so broad a spectrum of information as is attributed to that character in that particular book. I think what happened was there was one such person and the others were far less colorful and so the other information from the less colorful people was lumped together uh, and uh, there was created a uh, literary device which uh, I must admit was very effective. Well, the other question I have, uh, do you believe that the whole thing was... uh Mrs. Graham uh, from the Washington Post, I believe that's the publisher, was just out to get uh, Nixon and built this thing out of proportion to other things that other presidents were involved with. Well, uh, I, 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 there was nothing really that knew about it in my judgment and opinion, and certainly Mrs. Graham uh, 
her response to, to Richard Nixon, uh, I would characterize almost to this day as hysterical. However, uh, I, don't, I don't believe that uh, what occurred was a big plot by Mrs. Graham. I am not a subscriber to the conspiratorial view of history. You don't think that the press was out to get Nixon? And I think some elements of it were, but certainly not all of them, no. But wasn't there something about the man uh, which uh, nerved us up to assist in his uh, in tearing him down? Wasn't there something about the man and his performance, or perhaps his persona as it came to us, which um, readied us for his downfall? Perhaps there was to, to 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 some of you when you use the word us. There certainly was not to me. No, clearly I, I'm, not. I'm, I'm still an admirer of the man. Uh, so. Uh, while I can intellectually uh, I can't agree imagine. that you may have a point, I, I, I cannot identify with it. I can't imagine an uh, alternate scenario if essentially the same thing had all happened in the Kennedy administration with John F. Kennedy in the White House and with equal culpability on the part of President Kennedy, at least as regards some cover-up. I cannot believe that the outcome would have been the same. Possibly not, but I, I, I must say that I recall that, that President Kennedy had his virulent detractors also. And good Lord, uh, the man's dead, and you know how he died, and, and uh, uh, let's face it, they're, they're, uh, I, I don't think he was immune. Well, there, there's a mystery there about the relation between a people and its leader, and uh, the special character of the leader, at least as experienced by the people. He was somehow a distant and not quite credible, not quite lovable figure. He, well, didn't, he didn't have that special charismatic yeah. significance that yeah, but God Kennedy help was us able if, to if arrange. God help himself. us if lovableness becomes uh, a significant characteristic uh, necessary for President of the United States. We're in a world of trouble. No, I'm with you on this one. My own feelings about this, though, I take Watergate to have been a more serious crime, and its cover-up more serious than I think you do. My own feeling is that he was, in a way, savaged by the press, uh, and that uh, well, some elements of it, you know, again, you know, not all of the, we, we, we cannot paint it with too broad a brush. Uh, not all of the, all of the press savaged Richard Nixon. Certainly, some of them did. This is why I'm willing to characterize Mrs. Graham's response as, as hysterical. I mean, because I think really, in essence, it was. My point is simply that he aroused the bloodlust in us once he was in a significant on his way group down. of people. Yes, yeah. he did. He, he didn't arouse it in me and in many people I know. You are not a representative member of the American public. I don't know that I've ever claimed to be. With that established, we'll pause for a last round of commercials, then right back to the telephones. 591-7200. Again, back to Milt Rosenberg. Thank you, George, and right back to the telephones. Good evening. You're on the air. Good evening. How are you? Yes, sir. I want to commend Mr. Liddy on his uh, strong sense of self. Uh... I don't want to talk about the uh, misguidedness uh, comment that the uh, uh, one of the previous callers mentioned, but I have a kind of nitty-gritty question. It really has two parts, in a sense. The uh, Watergate 2 incident, as, as you've characterized it, the tape on the door situation. How do you account for that, Mr. Liddy? Uh, I mean, why was the tape put there? The tape was put there to hold the lock back. Crossways instead of vertically. <laughs> That is, that is the, uh, I'm, I don't mean this uh, as against you personally, sir, but that is one of the silliest things that's ever been proposed. If you take that cloth-founded uh, electrician's tape and you go and you put it vertically uh, on a door, especially one of those doors with a, with a with those commercial spring-loaded lock, you'll find that it pops right off. It, it will not hold. It only holds in that other position. And uh, that is the and the other position also happens to be the only way that the, the uh, cleaning personnel uh, do it. And the, the idea was to imitate the cleaning personnel, and the minute you tried to, to do it some other way, uh, uh, it's a dead uh, tip-off that it, uh, there's something wrong. This question but, is in the context of the standard uh, conspiracy Conspiratorial yeah. interpretation. That but, but try it. Get, get a hold of some electrician's okay. tape, not the plastic kind, you know, the, the, that cloth back tie. Put it on vertically and, and watch how long it holds. But let me check with Set the caller. Because the, uh, well, hold on, sir. I want to put a question to you. Uh, do I understand you correctly that you're asking that uh, on the basis of the hypothesis that this was a setup by the CIA? They wanted it all to be discovered and they blew the operation. No, no, purpose. not at all. I, I, I'm asking that because I think a lot of dumb things occurred and I thought that was one of them. No. 
Well, apparently it wasn't as dumb as all that. We thank you for the call. Thank you. 591-7200. Here's another caller. Good evening. Uh, Mr. Liddy. Yeah. Uh, a somewhat different question. Uh, during the height of Watergate, a uh, United Airlines plane was coming from Washington to Chicago right. and it crashed on its way into Mrs. Midway. This is Hunt, 10,000. Yep. And, uh, yes, I wonder if um, uh, cyanide any fumes. direct connection... No, cyanide fumes, or the, the allegation was, gee, cyanide fumes were found in the lungs of the, of the pilots and what have you. Uh, however, what has not been publicized sufficiently, in my judgment, is the fact that the materials from which the aircraft were built are very similar to the ones that one builds uh, uh, mobile homes from. And those plastic materials, when uh, ignited, give off cyanide fumes, and in the dying breath, the people around uh, ingest them. But no, I, I do not consider that to have been uh, anything other than a tragic accident. Uh, for all concern. I appreciate your comment. Thank yes, you. Indeed. And we appreciate your call, sir. Isn't it interesting? All the calls we've had so far, no, uh, one or two don't fit this generalization. Most of the calls have been on details of yeah, this saga. Aspects. Rather than picking up on uh, the, the issues that, I, yes, the, exactly, the, that yeah. I was pressing upon you. What yeah. do you make of that? Uh, I, I, this I, remains make our, of, I make of it that the, the, the one, the, the phenomenon of, of uh, obsession with the details of enormously publicized events, such as the, the, the Kennedy assassination. My Lord, you know, you've got uh, all kinds of, of things going on, uh, uh, theories about, you know, how, how many shoelaces did this fellow have, all that sort of business. It, it, it seems to be a pattern there. And secondly, I think, uh, obviously I may be wrong, that the American people really know deep down that Watergate is not all that unusual, that uh, this time the guys just got caught. And from a philosophical point of view, uh, it ain't that big a deal. Well, Gordon, remember what really was uh, considered in general uh, by the people, by the journalists, and finally by the Congress. The larger crime was not the break-in that uh, you engineered but rather, quote, the cover-up, and that being done by the president and his immediate adjutants. Mm -hmm. That was a violation of their responsibility and of their constitutional obligations, is the way the theme runs. I, I, I think you've drawn a valid distinction there, yes. Do you agree? Uh, we know that Mr. Nixon would have survived, in fact, if he hadn't attempted the cover-up. Well, I, I would go further. I, would, I think he would have survived if he'd burned those damn tapes, sure. to be frank. Uh, so there's an awful lot of what-if games that, that we can play with these central issues like this. Uh, I, I see your point. I, I don't know that I, that I am an, would be an adherent of it, because after all, I am, I am someone who, uh, to this day, admires Mr. Nixon and thought he was a very competent president. But I must say intellectually that I, that I think you make a valid point, and, and you, you draw uh, indeed a valid distinction between the two. I want to get to something uh, larger, and uh, again, I, I trust you'll bear with me with some patience as I try to lay something out. Sure. You've presented your, your worldview, the, the, the working philosophy of life and of the nature of the public realm in which things happen. And that philosophy is it's a hard world, inevitably competitive, inevitably in the struggle for great gains and great goals. And among those great goals for you, I'm sure, is the achievement of true polity and uh, the actualization of humane values for, uh, uh, for organized society. To, to the extent that they are possible. To the extent that they are possible, exactly. But you see it necessary to play the Machiavellian game, to recognize that it's a dirty world and inevitably the competition between values and between adherents of those values regresses to the dirtiest tricks I, I, might, I might state it a little differently, though. I, I, I would put it uh, that Machiavelli saw man as man, uh, using the capital M then in the universal sense. And he counseled his prince to be without illusion. And uh, I, I really cannot fault that, because I think so much harm comes from uh, the opposite view. But pressing that view, we come to a kind of dilemma which is quickly summarized in the doctrine that the ends cannot justify the means because the means then corrupt the ends. Or putting it in other 
terms that I find more congenial or more meaningful, if you are dedicated to the achievement of a better world, a better life in which higher values are ultimately served, don't you in fact put off forever the attainment of such a world if you slug it out at the necessarily dirty level of... Uh, of I, I, I of international no, or no, intranational no, competition. You see, it, when, when we say the, the attainment of such another world, I don't believe we are ever going to attain a change in the nature of man. Or in the nature of human society. Uh, ultimately, no. Ultimately, no. Ultimately... Then you're left with a very dark vision when, about well, the future, when, aren't you? Out in, out in the Atlantic Ocean... Jaws are swimming around there, not Charlie the Tuna. I don't think there's any way we can substitute the one for the other, no matter how much we want to. This is not to say that with with care, fortitude, courage, skill, uh, we cannot have a good life on the ocean. But we must always remember that there's no such thing as a free lunch. And uh, man ultimately will act as man. Uh, and, and there's no way out from that, Milt, uh, in my judgment. Ultimately, he'll go at the throat of his opponent, of his adversary. I don't believe that you're ever going to come to a situation where you can walk down the middle of the street in, in, in a bad neighborhood, looking like a wimp and holding a fat wallet in your hand, and expect to get to the other end of the street without it being taken away from you. I do think that an intelligent man who sends large, powerfully built chap down that street, uh, looking like he knows what he's doing and carrying a submachine gun, will probably get to the other end because they're going to pass him by and wait for the wimp. And all I'm saying is, let's us not play the role of the wimp. And you certainly have not been a wimp in your own life. We've had uh, some expression tonight necessarily uh, uh, pressed into a narrow frame by virtue of uh, the format of this program, but some expression of the values and the percepts by which you've organized your own life and your own sense of uh, obligation and duty. Um, how will it guide you through the rest of your life? Uh, the same way. Uh, I, I, I don't think it's it's probable that I will be called upon to, to serve my country in the same way. But one never knows what's going to happen tomorrow. And uh, if war were declared, I'd, I'd probably shave my mustache, lie about my age, and enlist. Uh, I would hope that my sons would do the same thing. What are your plans? This is, that's a, a well, terrible cliche question, but no, it seems I, to I, me I, a very interesting one. No, it's not at all. I, I, uh, what is the saying in tennis? Never change a winning game, always change a losing game. Uh, so far, I have I have met with some degree of success in writing. You write well. I enjoy writing. Thank you, sir. Uh, I should like to continue it, and I, I will. But I must admit that I'm somewhat making a virtue of necessity because the rather stringent uh, parole uh, strictures on me make what we would call conventional employment for, for me virtually impossible. You're a very interesting man and a totally honest one, and I much appreciate that. And though the differences between us have now been ventilated twice over the public air, right. I have respect for the steadfastness with which you... Thank you, sir. And uh, I must say that I would, I would welcome the opportunity to vent, uh, ventilate them yet again because I really enjoy this program. Anytime you're in town. Just Thank let you, us sir. know a few weeks before that you're going to be here so we can clear the decks for action. <laughs> Thank you, sir. We're out of time. Mr. Liddy's new book is Will, just published by St. Martin's. Thanks to all of you for listening.